You're a pro. You don't do DIY. You fix DIY. The only painter in higher demand than you was Picasso. Your flooring mastery leaves floors floored. So why is a pro like you still stuck in the endless cycle of paperwork, scheduling, spreadsheets, and chasing invoices? Automate your office and get back to what you love with Jobber, the all-in-one tool that fits your entire office in your back pocket. Start your free trial today at Jobber.com. It's time to do more arts and culture in Denver. Start by seeing Wicked at the Buell Theater, July 24th through August 25th. Then head out for new discoveries with Darkfield at the Bird Lot, July 11th through August 11th. And be sure to check out Bright Nights at Four Mile all August long at Four Mile Historic Park. What are you waiting for? Plan your arts and culture days at visitdenver.com slash do more. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man with a message, and that message is Yokiro Taco Bell. Here is the captain. True Crime and Taco Tuesday. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today, we are still sipping on some Founders Mortal Bloom. This is a delicious hazy ipa with 6.2 percent abv the brewers at founders selected four kinds of hops for this delicious beer citra mosaic chinook and cascade add in some wheat malt and oats plus some citrusy and tropical notes and there you have it founders mortal bloom garage grade four and a quarter bottle caps out of five and let's praise and cheers our friends for helping out with the beer fund first up a big shout out to Chendo from Dallas, Texas. And a big we like to give to Allison Pittman from Lincoln, United Kingdom. And here's a cheers to Carrie Hanko from Hubertus, Wisconsin. And last but certainly not least, we have a double fisted cheers to Phil and Rachel in Rochester, New York. Thank you to everyone for contributing to this week's beer fund for the beer run. Yeah, B W E W R U N beer run. Go to truecrimegarage.com and make sure you sign up on the mailing list. And, and guess what? That's enough of the business. All right. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Just like the call that came in after the horrific attack on Karen Potak, who survived, somehow managed to survive that attack from New Year's Eve on the last day of 1980. The attack that took place six months later, roughly six months later, that led to the murder of 18-year-old Kimberly Compton. I do know, Captain, here that the first call, at least the very first call in that series, that was traced to a payphone. In fact, police say that once they were able to compare their patrol and cruiser logs with the payphone booth call log, it's their belief that they arrived approximately one minute, one minute, 60 seconds after the killer caller hung up the phone. The St. Paul Police Department really worked this case about as thoroughly as anyone could. They released the call for the news channels to play some of the calls, you know, we discussed that there were multiple phone calls from the attacker in Kimberly Compton's case. Some of those calls were recorded. The ones that were recorded, those were released to the news outlets to play. 
The police were hoping that someone obviously would recognize the voice or even the words that were used in those calls. And if such a person came forward, this would be a major lead, a major break in their investigation. And then this is, this is smart. This is rather smart. In one of the calls, the killer said that he, quote, was getting drunk every day. So the detectives were going around and talking to and playing the calls, the recorded calls for bartenders and liquor store owners, hoping that one of them could identify the man's voice. Question for you. When you first heard these calls, did you believe that this man just had a higher pitch voice or do you believe that this was a, a way to disguise the voice or because he was emotional, is this why his voice was higher in pitch? I believed that it was a combination of a couple of the things you said. I think that it was a combination of he was emotional, whether that's selfishness or remorseful, what have you. I, I, I wouldn't, won't attempt to, to know the answer to that. But my guess here, Captain, is that it's a combo of being emotional and the attempt to, at the same time, to disguise his voice. And we both agree he's a piece of shit. Oh, I mean, there, <laughs> we shouldn't have to say it. If there's a person out there that thinks he's not, let's find you and put you away as well. Yeah, we might not need to say it, but it's fun to say. I mean, he, he's a he, piece of shit. He practically... He attempted to beat a woman to death with a tire iron or crowbar and then followed that up by six months later. So, so nicely attacking a woman with an ice pick that, oh, by the way, he stabbed her 61 times with, with an ice pick and then strangled her with her own shoelace. So, um, well, see to me, a this piece of shit doesn't do it justice. Well, and we've seen this with other cases, right? Where an attacker, a serial killer changes their weapon. And in this case, because we've seen it, whether it's been a gun used or a knife used, where I think these killers don't like the reaction of the victim. And so to, to stop that reaction, they strangle them. Yeah, I think that maybe this, unfortunately, that this is just, there's no nice way to put it. I really think he was just making sure he got the job done because he didn't with Karen. Right. And the, he, he got lucky in the Karen case. And, you know, I say this all the time in these situations, I've never reviewed one where the, the, the victim gets lucky. I've only reviewed cases where the assailant and the the killer get lucky. And he got lucky in that case that when she woke up, she couldn't recall anything about him. She couldn't describe his vehicle. She couldn't describe much of the attack at all. And I'm sure that that probably scared him as uh, let's, let's go down the road of, of pretending for a moment that he is truly remorseful. And then that old myth of that most of these serial killers want to get caught. Well, that's just frankly not true. I don't care what, what scientist or psychologist is going to try to sell me that I ain't buying it. Why? Because they continue to kill. I've, I've reviewed one serial killer case where the guy walked into the police department and said, I'm a serial killer. Lock me up one (laughs) out of hundreds of serial killer cases. So, well, I think it's a double edged sword because I do think some of these killers want to confess and they want, Oh yeah. they, They want this urge to stop and they want somebody to help them. But the consequence is once you then confess, you're going to prison and nobody wants to go to prison. You can have a slight bit of remorse, but still not want to get caught. Those are not the same thing. And so with this guy, I really think that the the, the strangulation with the shoelace was he got scared that his previous victim woke up and could have potentially described him in his vehicle and described their conversations. And that probably in his mind would have led him to getting caught because what we do know about these, these types, uh, from persons that eventually do get caught, Ed Kemper said this, BTK said this, that right after the first kill, both of them, it it just expected for helicopters and police sirens to start going off. Like that they, that they were caught without any investigation at all. Like there's that, that 
immediate paranoia. So his victim wakes up the first one and he definitely was scared at some point he was going to get caught for this. And I think that the shoelace was just not leaving the potential of not leaving the witness, making sure that this one doesn't wake up. Now we know that infamously this killer would go on to be known as the weepy voiced killer, but actually early on, they were calling him the whimpering killer. Again, just both different ways of describing the voice that police and dispatchers are hearing when the calls come in. And all we, I do have a transcript of one of the Kimberly Compton calls and I'm not, I'm not going to try to impersonate the call. I'll just, I'll yeah, just please. read it. <laughs> please don't. No, because the way that the voice to me, the best, the best thing that I can attempt to equate this voice to it. Do you remember, um, the, the sketch comic, Michael McDonald, mad TV, the Stuart Larkin skit where he yeah. plays the, the, the child. And to me, the, to me, the weepy voice killer or the whimpering, whimpering killer, whatever, you know, you want to call him to me, it sounds like someone attempting a male voice attempting to do an impersonation of Stuart Larkin's mother, Doreen. That's, that's what my, the way that it hits my, ears. well, and at least this serial killer name is not flattering. It's not like BTK or son of Sam, but if they would have just took my suggestion, the weepy pee pee voice killer. It's a little more degrading. So from the transcript of one of the Kimberly Compton calls, the transcript reads as follows. I am sorry what I did to Compton. I couldn't help it. I don't know why I had to stab her. I'm so upset about it. I keep getting drunk every day and I can't believe I killed her. I can't think of being locked up. If I get locked up, I'll kill myself. So after releasing the calls to the public, the police said that the the first few days they were receiving, quote, a call every five minutes. This from people offering information, submitting tips, and just trying to help in general. This provided, of course, a lot of leads for the five detectives that were dedicated, that, that the police department dedicated to this single case. But as quickly as this whole investigation ramped up, gaining momentum, it all came to an abrupt halt. When in late August of this same year of 1981, a man confronted police with a gun. When they tried to apprehend him, he fled and barricaded himself inside of his home. Actually, it was his parents' home for which he, as an adult, still lived with them. This was the start of a 15-hour standoff. The standoff ended when the man at 1.30 a.m. on Saturday, August 29th, he attempted to flee out the back door of the home and he was quickly apprehended by the police. So he fled the house because he had set several fires inside and was running out of options. Once inside the home, police discovered that 26 year old Alan Lopez, he's the man that fled from the home that was arrested. He had killed his parents, Raymond and Charlotte using an ax and a metal pipe. Now in the basement, police found the body of Lopez's sister, Linda, her age was 23 at the time, who was burned beyond recognition. This Alan Lopez would, to me, fit the description of the, quote, regular maniac, like the one Kimberly's grandfather was talking about. Alan Lopez confesses to the murder of Kimberly Compton, but then, while in jail for killing his parents and sister, Alan Lopez takes his own life. Unfortunately, he was a very, very disturbed individual. And along with his severe mental illness, he was drinking excessively. Probably a way to try to self-medicate. So, okay, well, that wraps things up. But not so fast, mister. Shout out to the great Lee Corso. So now we go to August 5th, 1982. This is after the death of Alan Lopez. 40-year-old Barbara Simons is at a place called the Hexagon Bar in Minneapolis. A man approached Barbara, asking for a cigarette, and she gave him one. And then the pair began talking. Barbara spoke with the man long enough for her to feel comfortable with him. 
As the night came to a close, he offered her a ride home and she accepted. After spending the night at the bar, Barbara Simons tells the bartender, quote, he's cute. I hope he's nice since he's giving me a ride home. Now, Simons was found stabbed to death the next day. The weepy voiced killer contacted police after the murder of Barbara saying, please don't talk. Just listen. I'm sorry I killed that girl. I stabbed her 40 times. Kimberly Compton was the first one over in St. Paul. So think about this for a second. You have law enforcement that believe that the the killer of Kimberly Compton killed himself in jail before he could be tried with these these other crimes that he was accused of, the, the burning the house, the killing of his parents and his sister. So for a couple of months, you don't have really much in the way of an investigation because you think this guy, well, he confessed to killing Kimberly Compton. And we know he's capable yeah. of such a crime. Most well, certainly. Question for you, because they did have uh, a sketch that they that they released of the suspect, but when did that happen? Well, that's perfect timing for that question, because this is where they get their first description of the man. So. There is a part of this case that's a little confusing to the outsider and, until you really delve and dive deep into this case. Wonky there was donkey. A, there was a sketch that was released shortly after Kimberly Compton was murdered, but that sketch was not of the. It, it, so I have to kind of fully describe this, or it won't make much sense. Yeah, they they released this sketch of this individual, and they say that this person is the last person seen talking to Kimberly Compton at the bus depot. Remember, she went from the, the bus depot to across the street to the diner. So they're not saying that the man that she was talking to at the diner is the same guy in the sketch that they're looking for. They're saying this guy, we have at least one witness or two witnesses saying a guy that looks like this was seen talking to her at the bus depot prior to going to the diner. They do go as far to say this man is wanted by police for questioning. Wanted is a weird word. They wouldn't use that today, but wanted for questioning. But they do clarify that police do not believe that the man in the sketch or the sketch of this man was the same as the caller who called after the murder, which they believe was the killer because he gives that detail of the ice pick. So what they're attempting to do with the release of that sketch. So when, when people take a first glance at this case, they think, Oh, they had a description of the killer right after Compton's murder, which would make sense because she was picked up at the diner. It would stand a reason that people saw the two of them sitting together and talking together. Right. But it doesn't appear to be that that was the case or that anybody had any real recollection of the man that she was sitting with. So now they're looking for this other dude because you know, as an investigator, she's not from here. She just stepped off the bus and then gets murdered. So what you're hoping is to connect with this guy that she was seen talking to at the bus depot, because your first question is going, you want to determine who truly was the last person to see her alive because that's your murderer. And so now you want to find this person so you can ask them simple questions like, when you talked to her, did she say she was meeting anyone? Did she offer up a name? Did she say where she was going? You know, you want to, you want to put together some more events and markers on her timeline that take that, that complete that timeline from bus depot through the diner to where she's found murdered by the, you know, by the river's edge. From my understanding, that person never comes forward now. And now let's fast forward to, we have this murder of Barbara Simons. They had a confession by Alan Lopez, who now doesn't seem to hold much weight at all because Barbara Simons is killed in a very similar same manner as Kimberly Compton. And this weepy voice guy is back on the phone calling 911 and police and saying, I, I'm sorry I killed that girl. I stabbed her 40 times. And then finishing up the call saying Kimberly Compton was the first one over in St. Paul. So now you have this other confession. And oh, by the way, the voice sounds the same as the calls that you're getting from the Kimberly Compton case. Yeah. And I'm guessing because we have recordings of those that law enforcement was able to compare those, 
but it's also difficult because we have a person that confessed to the crimes, but they're dead. So yeah, we've you know, all to play Captain Obvious. We can't question that in, individual. We've all watched and probably enjoyed the crime fiction shows where there's some killer on the loose. Somebody confesses to it, or they think they found the guy, but he dies abruptly. And then all oh, the killing starts again, 10 years later. And it's this big, great TV mystery. But right. here in real life, it's, it's months later after Alan Lopez dies that police are going, wait a second. We, we didn't have the guy. Alan Lopez wasn't the guy. And at the very least, he wasn't the guy in this Barbara Simons case because he, he wasn't alive. And by the way, the phone call that comes in confessing to Kimberly Compton with this weepy voice, high pitched voice is the same voice we got. And it's the same MO, right? She stabbed 40 times with an ice pick. So a lot of this stuff is lining up. What's confusing though, is that there's two sketches in the one sketch. Yeah. So what we, what we have here is we get, we'll, we're going to get to police getting a, a true description of our killer. Okay. So I mean, if you guys see the sketch, if you guys are Holland Oats fans, I mean, if you told me that it was a an advertisement for a Holland Oats show, I'd go, hey, not a bad drawing of Holland Oats. Well, and the sketch that you're seeing next to that, if if I'm thinking of the same one that you're you're looking at right now, yeah. the the sketch that's next to it looks very different, right? Mm-hmm. Then right. So you get you get um John Oates on the one side on the right, and then you get a guy to me that vaguely resembles the still unknown Connecticut river Valley killer. Like yeah. that, isn't yeah. that weird? Like it looks very similar to me, but my guess here, captain is I couldn't find explanation for what that other sketch was, where that came from. My guess is that is a rendition of what somebody thought they saw of the man talking to Compton at the diner. Well, and it's also possible because we don't know how long was she at this diner and did multiple people come up to her and talk to her? Yeah. And so, and this would be a, a busy diner. Like I said, it's been around since 1960. Yeah. It's a very popular place. Anybody some, that some would say world famous, if anybody that frequents a diner knows how it, the turn and burn style of the tables, right? It's like, it's fast food dressed up at most diners, right? It's, it's, it's quick in and quick out for everybody. And so here is where we're going to get a truly good description. And I'll get into the description of that here in a minute and the reason why. But Barbara S- Simons, her body was discovered by a paper boy walking along the Mississippi River. This is near 29th Street. Now, police know from talking to people that knew Barbara that she was at that hexagon bar that night. Okay. And she doesn't come home from her bar visit alive. She's found dead near the Mississippi river. They go to the hexagon bar and remember the bartender there, that bartender is able to provide a very good description of the man that left with Barbara. So remember this bartender, God bless her. She made mental note of the dude after being told by Barbara, Hey, this guy is going to drive me home. So she provides a description to police. Ultimately, what they're going to do is they're going to look for anybody that has a record, you know, anybody that they have a mugshot of that resembles this description provided to them by the bartender. And they're using this. They got mugshots because they're looking at persons that have priors, specifically priors for assault. Because what do we know that our killer does? He assaults our victims, obviously. Kimberly Compton, having been stabbed but but the previous victim who survived being beaten so now we have this description of the person believed to last be seen with barbara so this is very likely our killer the detectives come back and they show several mug shots to the bartender and she picks out a dude from from this photo lineup if you will and i don't know how many of dozens of pictures she she had to look through but she picks out this man named paul stefani so she tells police that's the dude out of all the pictures you've shown me. This is the dude that Barbara left with that. She left with this Paul Stefani the night of her murder. And we have the call after Barbara's murder. And during that call, the confession to the Compton murder. So really up until this point, police thinking that the killer of Compton was Alan Lopez. Now this is not looking good 
not looking so good. And, and we still have a killer out there and it might be this Paul Stefani guy. And what do we know or what does law enforcement know about old Paul Stefani? Well, it's, I mean, it's quick. You run, run everything on the background. You have his license, driver's license information. So they know where he lives and they're going to very quickly put him under surveillance. And we've seen this done in many cases where we have a repeat offender. It looks to me, you know, there, there are some cases where it's almost comical. You, you hate given the, the situation, the overall encompassing situation of what's going on, but it's almost comical when the person being tailed knows and points out to police that they're being tailed. It doesn't, there's no way that Paul Stefani had any clue that he was under police surveillance. There's, there is every indication that he, that he had no idea that he was a suspect in any of these cases. Yeah, but the the interesting thing here is, and what law enforcement is going to learn really quickly is, so we have an individual going, hey, I'm picking out Paul Stefani, that's who she left with, and all by the way, he he worked at a company, a manufacturing company, that's going to be really important to this investigation. Yeah, he at one time worked at the manufacturing company for which Karen Potox, uh, even though she survived, she was found near the train tracks behind that business. It was a couple years prior to her attack that he had worked there, but he had worked there for a considerable amount of time as a janitor. Right. But, but I think that's big. If you're law enforcement, we can at least connect this idiot to this location. Oh, 100%. You're you, when you are provided with this description and then she picks him out of this photo lineup yeah. You are looking for other reasons to make him an even better suspect, right? Because again, with these investigations, we can sit here in retrospect and condemn and criticize and critique every aspect of any investigation out there, but, and we will do that, <laughs> but, the, but the truth of it is what goes on behind closed doors is everybody works for somebody shit runs downhill and and when you need to get things approved, you have to go to the higher ups to get approval. Surveillance isn't free. Manpower isn't free. These things yeah. cost dollars and cents and have to make sense when you're trying to sell them to the boss who's going to sign off on budgeted items like this. So you're not going into, if you go in and, and talk to your boss and say, well, this bartender picked out this dude from a, dozens of photos, he or she is likely going to look at you cross and say, yeah, really? That's all you're bringing me? Why don't you go out there and do your job and bring me something better and I'll sign off on this. So what we do know is that surveillance was signed off on Stefani and they start to track this dude and they're, they're following him around, but for whatever reason, what he's up to next, the police, they're not aware of that. He, he, either he lost them or maybe they ran out of Surveillance. Remember when we talked about Robert Picton, they had only approved a three day surveillance on Robert Picton. Well, if your target doesn't do anything bad or doesn't look to be up to anything suspicious during the, that time frame, then it's kind of all for naught. So now we got to go to August 21st, 1982. Again, when now we're in Minneapolis This is when Paul Stefani picked up a 19-year-old sex worker. Her name is Denise Williams. So a little bit different victimology here. Williams, she would later say that she sensed something was wrong with the whole situation when the driver, the vehicle she gets into, he's, he's not going to where they said they were going to go to. They ended up in a suburban area rather than staying in the city or going back to the city like they had originally planned. Then he turns down a dead end road. This woman, this young woman, she's worked the streets long enough that she, she is incredibly street smart. She's got a very good sense about her when things aren't right. And and she's knowing that things aren't right. So she's already kind of planning an escape if she needs to make one. You know, that's a, that's one of those weird things. If you read like survival 
books and, and things of that nature, they, they say that persons that plan their escape in any situation prior to needing to escape, it's something crazy. Like they stand a, a 30 to 40% better chance of surviving the situation. Like even with like a, like a plane crash or, or a situation like this. So she's already planning what do I do if this guy does A, B, and C? Now she's stuck with this dude in the car. And that's when he is finally going to decide to attack Denise. With big wireless providers, what you see is never what you get. Somewhere between the store and your first month's bill, the price magically skyrockets. With Mint Mobile, you'll never have to worry about gotchas again. When Mint Mobile says 15 bucks a month when you purchase a three-month plan, they mean it. I do not like to do business with anyone or any entity that provides me with complicated bills, upcharges, and is constantly increasing their monthly fees. It's dishonest. It's bad business practices. Mint Mobile is not that. All Mint Mobile plans come with high-speed data and unlimited talk and text delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. You can use your own phone, your own phone number, and all of your existing contacts. Ditch overpriced wireless with Mint Mobile's deal and get three months of premium wireless service for 15 bucks a month. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month premium wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash TCG. That's mintmobile.com slash TCG. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash TCG. $45 upfront payment required, equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only, speed slower above 40 gigabytes on unlimited plan. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. All right, we are back. Cheers to the people in the front, onwards and upwards. Stefani starts to attack this poor woman, Denise Williams. And she, as said, has already made some uh, choices as to what she will, how she will respond if this guy starts acting weird or aggressive or violent. Right. She picks up a bottle. So he's attempting to, and unfortunately successful several times in stabbing her with a screwdriver during this attack. She hits this guy, Stefani over the head with a glass bottle, causing quite a bit of damage to his head and face. His already ugly head and face just got a little bit uglier. So the two of them, they're kind of rustling around there. Now, now it's a fight, right? It's not just one person attacking another. She's defending herself and she's doing a darn good job of it. She's yelling and screaming and there's some quotes that go here. She's yelling things like he's trying to kill me or help. He's trying to kill me. Her screams. Remember we said that, that he went into a suburban area with, with the car, with, with her in the car, these screams are, they grab the attention of a man who lives nearby. And now he, he hears it. He's an ear witness. And now being an eyewitness, he turns and looks and he sees this scuffle going on. Right. And so he runs over, jumps in. This good Samaritan, his name is Douglas Panning. He runs to the scene and he's attempting to pull the man off of the woman who's being attacked. And now these two are in it together. And eventually he breaks away from the fight. The, the good Samaritan, Douglas Panning, breaks away from this fight and he runs back to his home. He grabs a gun, but the assailant, Paul Stefani, takes off. But Doug then calls 911. He wants first to get an ambulance for this poor woman. Right, because we know she's been stabbed. She's been stabbed. Um, unfortunately, she was stabbed 16, I believe it was 16 times, 15 times with the screwdriver. Jesus. Uh, the assailant, thankfully, has been, he's been brutalized a little bit himself. He was bleeding profusely from, from the head and face area after receiving a couple hits from this glass bottle from the, the very tough, don't mess with me, Denise Williams. So Stefani 
he retreats back to his home, to his apartment, and he's bleeding very badly. He's in need of medical attention. So Captain Dumas here calls 911 for an ambulance saying that hey, I've been beat up and I've been robbed and I need medical attention. There's a whole bunch of things that are kind of going on simultaneously, right? So this call comes in for this dude. They know that the attacker on Denise Williams, they don't know that it's Stefani at this point. Remember, he wasn't under surveillance when this attack occurred. But we have a very street smart woman who's able to provide description of the vehicle of the of the attacker. We have the Good Samaritan that showed up who's able to provide description of the attacker and the vehicle. And now they got this dude that's going to the hospital who, oh, by the way, another phone call made because he's calling in for help for himself. And so with all of these things going on, police are able to quickly put together, oh, we need to go to the hospital and arrest this dude. He's, he's got the same injuries that's described to us by the person he attacked and the person that helped her. And so they go and they arrest him there. And it's the phone, a combination of the phone call, the injuries, the description, and both Denise and Doug later identifying the man, Stefani, as the attacker. So further investigative work would later connect Paul Stefani to the murder of Barbara Simons. Right. So this is going to lead to a murder charge, attempted murder charge, and a trial that is going to follow. During Paul Stefani's trial in the Barbara Simons murder case, they called to testify Stefani's ex-wife, his sister, and a woman who lived with him for a period of time. They all testified that they believed, you know, they're playing these phone calls, the weepy voiced killers, phone calls, 911 calls in the courtroom. And all three of them are testifying that they all believe that is the person I know as Paul Stefani. And it's super weird, too, because the sister who would have known him longer than any of the other people who testified, she says that she could recall at times throughout their their lives that when he would get incredibly angry or upset, he would go into that weird voice. So what you're saying is it's uh, maybe the voice is more out of habit than it was to disguise his voice. Yeah, maybe it's something he couldn't control. Very strange, though. It's incredibly strange, and I, I also believe that maybe there is some level of attempting to disguise right. his voice. We, we we will never know. And what's weird is there's he's an interesting cat in the sense that there is a lot of people that have tried to come up with the psychology of this because it's not normal. One, well, it's not normal to murder people, but then add the added layer of calling in these calls to authorities very quickly after committing these horrific acts. Right. But what we do know, captain, and this is where, this is where things get a little wonky for me in the, in the storytelling portion, because we weren't at the trial. So I, I don't know why this was how things played out, but what we do know is that Paul Stefani was in fact convicted of Barbara Simon's murder and the attempted murder of Denise Williams, but not so in Kim Compton's, murder. And I, I don't know, again, I don't know why that panned out the way that it did. He is sentenced to 40 years behind bars. So while he's convicted of these two offenses, he is, it doesn't sound like these observations made by testimony of the three pre people we just discussed was enough to identify him conclusively as the killer of Kim Compton. But we're not done there because in 1997, Paul Stefani was diagnosed with skin cancer. Part of this diagnosis is that he has less than a year to live. He decided to confess to the murders of Kim Compton. He's already convicted of Barbara Simons, but he remember he's convicted because he pled not guilty. That's why there was a trial. So he confesses to her murder as well. And then he convinced he confesses to an unknown victim, Kathy Greening. Paul Stefani had never even been a suspect in Kathy Greening's murder. Yeah, but again, I think this goes with the weird calling right after the the murder. Is it is it some sort of remorse? Is it some sort of you know maybe I'll get forgiveness? 
And so it's not it's not that strange to me that he would confess to other crimes he committed. Well, and and he's essentially given a death sentence, even though it's not the state that's going to kill him. It's the right. skin cancer that's going to take his life. So he he grew up in a devout ca- uh, Catholic household. Yeah, wasn't he the baby of 10? The information I had, I think, said the baby of six. But yeah, you're right. It was a large family. Maybe maybe that my numbers are a included, little low. That might have included step siblings. That's true, because his mother did remarry. The thing here, though, is, and I don't want to go too far down this road of Catholicism, because I grew up Catholic. I feel like when people start talking about religion mixed up with these horrible, nasty people, the, like they can pretend to be religious as much as they want to, or or maybe they even have convinced themselves in their heart of hearts that they are religious and God-fearing people. I'm here to tell you that they really aren't because the worst sin you can commit is the one that they are committing. And sometimes time and time again. So part of Catholicism is, again, not pretending to be, to know all the in and outs of it because every, every religion is complicated. But part of it is if you repent and you are truly remorseful, then you may be forgiven for your sins. And so I really think that this was not less of a helpful act on his behalf and more of a selfish act on his behalf of confessing to these murders before he knows that he's going to die. And if he believes in in what he was raised in, then he's going to have to meet his maker and answer for and justify maybe his actions. So I think it was really just a selfish move, but what it does help is it it gets the it confirms everyone's suspicions that he killed Kimberly Compton. So that case is closed. But again, the weird move with this Kathleen Greening, where he's not even a suspect. Now, he wasn't a suspect in that case because there was no phone call to 911 or to police afterward saying, oh, I killed her. You know, sorry, I killed him. There, I said I wasn't going to impersonate him. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I yes, just, man. yes. Finally, <laughs> that just made my day. Her murder was very, very different from mm-hmm. the other ones that we discussed. She she had been drowned in a bathtub inside of her home. Yeah. A July 20th, 1982. Her body was discovered in the bathtub by a friend the next day, and it was actually ruled an accident at the time. Now, this guy, completely off the rails, he has no idea. Again, we talked about that paranoia setting in quickly with these types, he likely was very paranoid that they could connect this to him and very unaware that it was ruled an accident. So he never, he never calls in. They don't connect it to him, but what police find after he, so he's still alive when he confesses to these, obviously, but he's still alive for a period of time after the confessions, it wasn't like confessing on his deathbed in his dying moments. He's confessing in advance and, they find he doesn't offer anything in the way of details. So it's just simply, this is what I did. And I drowned this woman, Kathleen Greening in 1982 in her apartment. Well, upon further investigation, they're looking at Kathleen's personal items. And in her address book, they find a phone number for a Paul S. Well, his name is Paul Stefani. And it is his phone number that's listed next to Paul S. So he likely didn't make the phone call in this one, regardless of why he made the phone calls in the previous attacks, because the two knew each other. There was a way she wasn't a stranger to him like the other victims. There was or would have been a way potentially to connect perpetrator to victim in the Greening case. The other thing too here, Captain, that we that we kind of missed and skipped over on accident here Part of that confession is Stefani did confess to the attempted murder of Karen Potak, who who survived the the first known. She would be the first known victim of the weepy voice killer. So lump that one in with the rest of them. I talked earlier about much has been done in the way of trying to dissect the psychology of an individual that would murder and then very quickly phone it in to police and and notify emergency services. The one thing that I think if you really want to go down that road and really try to, to figure this guy out, the thing that I would point to that I think 
has something to do with his actions. The choice of payphone that he used to call and notify emergency services. This is very rare that somebody would do this, right? This horrible act followed by the phone call. Another perpetrator that did exactly the same thing, but in a slightly different manner, would be the Zodiac Killer. He killed, went to a payphone, notified the police. His calls were much shorter, less detailed. It was a confession. Doesn't sound remorseful. You know, he simply says, I killed those two kids by blah, 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 goodbye. A little more taunting than remorse. Yeah, but one thing that when we reviewed the Zodiac case that that will that haunts me to this day amongst a, mo- a million other parts of that case, but one thing that I didn't know going into researching that case was the proximity of the payphone in relationship to the murders. In at least two of those cases, we were able to figure out from information that we found where, you know, we didn't, we didn't, we weren't the detectives that found this information, but we found this information through doing enough digging. This isn't stuff that was just sitting there on the surface for anybody to find. In two of those cases for Zodiac, the, the payphone was in route, somewhere in route from the police station to where the bodies would be found. And there is some psychology there that the Zodiac killer in those two cases would have been able, if they turned on their sirens early enough, he would have been able to hear the police rushing off to his murder scene that is by his design. And with Paul Stefani, there's something very similar there where you're right, Captain, he's not taunting police like Zodiac was Zodiac at the heart of Zodiac. He is a terrorist. And the taunts come with terrorism. But with Paul Stefani, he too, in a weird way, appears to be at payphones close enough that he would know that police and emergency services, and in fact, he's calling for an ambulance in the first case. He's close enough to the crime scene that he would be aware that there is actually a response to his call. Remember, we know in the in the one case, police are telling us we arrived at the payphone within one minute of him hanging up the phone. That's because he's so close to the crime scene. I mean, that to me, like, I'm not going to pretend to know what that means. It boggles my, my little garage brain, but it, I just find it fascinating, intriguing, mysterious, and, and haunting. Very, very weird and cruel and haunting. Paul Stefani, thankfully, the diagnosis was correct. He did die of cancer. This took place on June 12th. 1988, he passed away at the maximum security prison in Minnesota, the Minnesota Correctional Facility in Oak Park Heights. And that is the story. That is the story or what is known of the man who is now known as the weepy voiced killer. I want to thank everybody for joining us here in the garage each and every week. Thank you so much for sharing these stories on social media. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading for the beautiful listeners? We're going to run it back this week, Captain. We're going to recommend one that we have recommended before for good reason, because it falls in line with a lot of what we talked about here this week in the garage. So this week we are recommending When a Killer Calls, a haunting story of murder, criminal profiling, and justice in a small town by the great John Douglas and Mark Olshaker, authors of the best-selling book, Mindhunter. We all wanted season three of Mindhunter, and, well, we're not going to get it. So this is going to be the next best thing. When a Killer Calls is a book that we have recommended before, as said, it came out in 2022, and you can check out our coverage on this case as well. We did a three-part series with the same title, When a Killer Calls, That's True Crime Garage episodes 553, 554, and 555 on your True Crime Garage listening dial. That was from February of 2022. When we had John Douglas on as a returning guest of the show, we were able to play some of the audio from those phone calls from serial killer Larry Jean Bell. Now, at that time, the full-length audio was not available anywhere else yet. So that was some interesting heartbreaking stuff. 
But the podcast is just half of the story. So check out our coverage of When a Killer Calls in that three-part series, and then go and get the book as well, When a Killer Calls by John Douglas, available on Amazon and Audible as well. And until next week, be good, be kind, and don't live.